so we're very excited uh, about this year's um, Hans Fischer Lectureship. It's our first one uh, in the new um, IFNH facility. Um, we have a wonderful crowd today. Uh, the other thing that is, uh, you're going to hear about um, uh, is that this is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Department of uh, Nutrition originally, now the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a couple seconds. Um, and so this is a really, um, uh, just a, a great year for us, and we're looking forward to um, a, a great year in, in nutrition and food and, and health as we go along. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce um, uh, Executive Dean Goodman of the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. So my short-term memory can sometimes be a problem, but I don't think you introduced yourself. So may I do so, please? <laughs> that was Professor and Department Chair Josh Miller, who joined us uh, in 2012 uh, as the chair. And um, those of you in the department and around know that he's done a terrific job in his initial years as chair, and we expect to, to continue to do great work on behalf of all of us. So. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to see such a marvelous crowd and to welcome the Fishers back to campus and uh, to be part of this uh, auspicious, wonderful occasion uh, that I know from many personal uh, interactions with Hans means uh, so much to him as part of his legacy and a legacy he does have you could argue whether when the Department of Nutrition started here 50 years ago with one faculty member, Hans Fischer, you could argue whether the intellectual span of the department now uh, in the double figures um, has increased so prodigious and so in, uh, expansive and so profoundly uh, important is uh, Hans's own intellect and his own contribution to this field. I'm sure uh, in his modesty, and he'd be right because you know, 20 people, um, even 20 mortals, uh, probably could add up to uh, more than one immortal nutritionist. But anyway, um, uh, it's, it's great to uh, be part of this celebration and, and to uh, kind of open the year, although we really opened it with the Russell Symposium a few a couple of months ago, a month ago, uh, the many uh, events that will celebrate the 50th anniversary of this department um, here at, at Rutgers. So um, I don't want to take too much time, but I'm awfully tempted to tell a little story. So I'm going to tell a brief version of the story. So when Hans retired. There was a lovely event, as I recall, on a Sunday afternoon out in Franklin at a hotel ballroom type setting. Uh, I was relatively new here at the time and um, had really just begun to get to know Hans, uh, a project that has continued for over a decade. Uh, and I already knew about him that he didn't wear humor on the surface, but what I discovered, and thanks to Judy Storch, um, I've discovered that there is actually a printed version, was that Hans has a very deep sense of humor, because in his retirement talk, he spoke about the discovery and the properties of a new element, um, administratum. Now, he didn't say administratium, uh, aluminium, think aluminum, aluminium. So he um, demonstrated his deep integration into American society and American culture and our, the way we use our language. It was admi administratum. And administratum has a number of very important features. Um, it's atomic mass. Um, detectable only half of the time, particles held together by a force which involves the continuous exchange of meson-like particles called morons. 
since it has no electrons, administratum is completely inert. <laughs> Nevertheless, its presence, I'm quoting now, its presence can be detected because it impedes every re reaction with which it comes into contact. One experiment, which should have lasted only a few days, is still running after <laughs> many years due to the addition of just one milligram of administratum. <laughs> It is weakly active. It has a normal half-life of approximately six months. After this time, it does not actually decay, but undergoes a metamorphosis in which assistant neutrons, executive neutrons, vice neutrons, and assistant vice neutrons exchange places. <laughs> this almost invariably leads to an increase in atomic weight, hence it is self-sustaining. Although it occurs widely, administratum is, tends to concentrate around large corporations, research laboratories, and government departments. It can especially be found in recently reorganized sites, and there is reason to believe that it is heavily involved in the processes of deforestation and global warming. It should be remembered that administratum is known to be toxic at all concentrations and can easily destroy productive reactions where it is allowed to accumulate. Numerous attempts have been made to determine how administratum can be controlled to prevent irreversible damage, but results to date are not promising. So as the new dean, relatively new dean sitting in the room, I thought, man, that's a challenge. <laughs> and I'm going to resist the temptation to be too critical of Hans because I adore this man and uh, we all do, and we owe him so much for what he's contributed to making this community uh, of uh, nutrition, uh, food, nutrition, and health now, as we're calling it, uh, the real viable force that it is today at Rutgers. And it all started with Hans Fischer. Hans. In recognition of the other anniversary that we're celebrating, the 250th of Rutgers, I present Hans uh, a book, uh, Rutgers, a 250th anniversary portrait. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, there are three anniversaries that we celebrate this year and actually all around this time. The first one was mentioned already, namely that this is the 50th anniversary of the founding uh, of the department. A second one is that I believe it's the 25th anniversary of this lecture series. Hard to believe. It was uh, recommended to the university as a result of a review of the department in 1991 by John Sutty, who was then chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Nutrition at the University of Wisconsin. The third uh, anniversary, which in my mind's eye, I have come to believe maybe the reason why the Department of Nutrition got started 50 years ago is that it is also the anniversary of the start of the School of Medicine at Rutgers, which also started in 1966. The story was told that the then president of Rutgers, man by the name of Mason Gross, Dr. Mason Gross, a philosopher, had been asked to give a lecture to the American Dietetic Association in Philadelphia. And the next day, the Philadelphia Inquirer had a feature article indicating that he mentioned that Rutgers would start a department of nutrition. I have researched this the Philadelphia Inquirer can't find anything about this in their files. The American Dietetic Association claims they never had a meeting in Philadelphia in 1966. <laughs> so I don't know where that story came from. But my th 
newest theory is that the reason for all this is the medical school. The dean of the medical school was a renowned biochemist by the name of Dr. DeWitt Stetton, at the time uh, working at Columbia University, who also had a great interest in nutrition. And I have a suspicion that he told Dr. Mason Gross that it would be great for the university and for the medical school to have a department of nutrition. Perhaps there's somebody here who can research that. Maybe there are some records somewhere in Dr. Stetton's files. But in any case, that's my latest theory. I'm very happy that the department has flourished and uh, we have such a beautiful turnout today and I'm looking forward to the lecture by Dr. Hill and uh, he is going to talk on a subject that is one of the biggest public health problems in the Western world today. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the organizers and everyone else who has been involved with this program. Okay, so um, the uh, Hans Fischer lectureship, uh, as you heard, is 25 years or so uh, in the running, and uh, many of the uh, some famous names in nutrition have uh, spoken here, including uh, Hector DeLuca, Robert Cousins, John Sutty, uh, David Krzyzewski, Vernon Young, Charles Lieber, Gary Beecham, uh, as well as a couple of uh, Hans's uh, sons actually uh, uh, spoke at this. Um, um, la and we had George Blackburn recently, and then the most recently last year was uh, Martin Blazer. And so it's my pleasure to introduce um, the, the newest addition to this list, uh, Dr. James O. Hill. Um, uh, Dr. Hill it, um, comes through the uh, uh, University of Tennessee and the University of New Hampshire for his undergraduate and graduate degrees in physiological psychology. Uh, he was chair of the first World Health Organization Consultation on Obesity uh, in 1997, uh, president of the Obesity Society 1997 to 98, uh, and the American Society for T Nutrition uh, 2008 to 9. Uh, member of the NIH expert panel on obesity that developed the first U.S. guidelines for the treatment and prevention of obesity. Uh, he has uh, published more than 500 scientific articles and book chapters, uh, many focused on the importance of healthy eating, physical activity, and weight management. Uh, he's received uh, the, several awards from the Obesity Society, the American Society for Nutrition. Uh, he was the new 2012 Atwater Lecturer for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2014, among uh, many other um, accolades. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, today's Hans Fischer Lectureship Speaker, Dr. James O'Hill. Well, thanks, Josh. It's a real honor for me to be here and to be able to present this lecture. And it's an especial honor that Dr. Fisher is here. The bar is high. I better do a good job with him sitting here. And also, it's really nice to uh, be the first one in this new wonderful building. So what I want to talk to you today is, is, is about obesity. And I want to ask the question, do we really know how to reduce obesity in the population? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, it's important these days you put your disclosure in. I've worked with a lot of companies. I've written a couple of books. Probably the most important is at the bottom. I have a bias, I have a strong belief that industry should interact with academia, and have a strong belief that we need industry at the table if we're going to solve this problem of obesity. I want to start with the conclusions. Those of you who are time challenged and aren't going to, aren't going to question this, this is what I'm going to conclude uh, in my talk. I don't think we're on track to reduce obesity. I think we're doing a lot of good things. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good things but I don't think it's enough. I don't think that continuing to do what we're going to do is going to have an impact. I think we need new and different thinking to solve the problem. 
And it would be presumptuous of me to stand up here and say, I have the answer. I don't have the answer. What I want to do today is to share with you a little of the ways I've been thinking about this and maybe stimulate you to think about some new directions and what that new thinking and, and um, uh, innovation might look like. And hopefully at the end we'll have some time uh, to discuss this. So let's start with the current situation. Uh, you guys know this. The current situation is not good, right? Here's adult obesity. You can see it's been going up um, since the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, we thought maybe a few years ago it had sort of leveled off, but the newest data suggests that it's probably still increasing. But nonetheless, we're climbing toward 40% of our population being obese and another at least a third being overweight. So being normal weight is becoming the exception. Another way to look at it is you walk down the street, seven out of 10 people you see are likely going to be overweight or obese. Situation is no better with kids. Uh, we've, while obesity in adults has doubled over the past few decades, it's tripled in kids. One of the things we know is that uh, obese kids don't grow out of it. They grow up to be obese adults with all those problems. And so it's difficult looking at this to be very optimistic about the future. And this is the US, but what about the rest of the world? All you, all you need to see here, these are different regions of the world. And the bottom slide shows you that in every region of the world, the trends are up. So it's not just a US thing. I think obesity, we're still number one. So it's one thing we're really good at is making people obese. But the rest of the world is catching up. So we've got a serious, serious problem. And that problem is across all age groups, all ethnic SES groups, and it's worldwide. So have I depressed you enough to start with? Okay. One of the things I think a lot about is what's causing the increase in obesity. And I bet many of you think about this as well. What we've been focusing on largely is looking at this, focusing on single factors and really hoping for simple solutions. So there's a lot of work now in healthy food access and availability, walkable communities, outdoor parks and spaces, inner city gardens and home gardens, taxes and ban on junk foods. I'm not saying these things aren't important, but I think it's very, very unlikely that focusing on any one or any two of these things is going to have an effect. The problem is there are so many things that impact obesity. And I think one of the problems our field has had, and I'll talk about this in detail, is getting a handle on that complexity and being able to understand it and use it to come up with solutions going forward. We continue to debate causal factors as if one thing is responsible. The one that just kills me is debating diet versus physical activity. If, if you ask the question, of whether diet or physical activity is more important for obesity, in my opinion, you don't understand the physiological regulation of body weight. That would be like me asking, which is more important for your net worth, your income or your spending? And the answer is both. And if there's one thing I would love to see us spend less energy on, it's debating which is more important and really trying to understand how they fit together. So it kills me when I see papers like this. Physical activity does not influence obesity risk. Time to clarify the public health message. If you believe that, in my opinion, you're not keeping up with the literature. If you believe that it's all physical activity, you're not keeping up with the literature. It has to be both. The sugar fat debate, when will we learn? We want to focus on one thing. So now we're saying, oh my God, all this, everything we told you about fat's wrong. It's all carbohydrates and sugar. Can't we accept that both play a role? I know from my own work that if you overeat either fat or carbohydrate, most of that excess energy is stored. So we spend a lot of time debating the single causal factors. And I think we, what we have to understand is all these things fit together. So the question is how we, how we comprehend that and how we move forward. So I'll give you an example here. These are NHANES intakes. Um, 
and, and you may or may not uh, put much stock in self-reported food intake. I know there's been a lot of criticism lately, but these are the information we have. So if you look back, we really started in the 70s, 80s, telling people to reduce fat. What you can see here is that telling people to reduce fat didn't lead to a reduction in fat. So we had a public health campaign to tell people to reduce fat. Fat didn't go down. What happened? Carbohydrate consumption went up. So fat intake stayed the same, at least according to these data. Carbohydrate intake went up and everybody says, oh my gosh, we, we told people to reduce fat and they ate more carbohydrate. We, we didn't anticipate that. And that's one of the issues we have in our field is unanticipated consequences. Okay, now fast forward. What we're telling people to do now is reduce sugar. I don't have any problem with the message that we eat too much sugar, but as a, as a scientist, one of the things I wonder is if people eat less sugar, what are they doing instead? Are they simply reducing their overall food intake? I doubt it, but we need to know that. Are they coming back and eating more fat? And we again could suffer from the issue of unintended consequences. So focusing on reducing sugar may or may not be a good overall public health strategy. I think we need to know the consequences of that. When we tell people to reduce sugar and they do it, what happens to their overall intake? Do they compensate? What happens to the composition of their diet? What happens to their activity? These are the things that we need to learn. But I think this, this issue of, oh, we got it wrong with fat, and now we're getting it right with sugar, I'm afraid it's going to backfire again. And there's going to come a point down the road where we said, oh my gosh, we told you to reduce sugar. We really meant to increase protein, or who knows? So, I think we have to understand that it's the interplay between nutrients and it's the total diet that's important. I get a lot of my information from Time Magazine. and I picked up Time Magazine a while ago and it told me the myth about exercise. Exercise really has no role in, in, in weight management. Well, this was news to me as someone that spent a lot of time in this field. Um, and I wondered, uh, there's a whole literature. I, you know, I have a foot in the nutrition community, I also have a foot in the exercise science community. And I go back and look at all these papers in exercise science, and it seems pretty clear to me that exercise has a big role in weight management. And, and, and why would people want to say it isn't? Part of the issue here is one of the things, if you read this article, it says, oh, if you increase exercise, you just eat more. So exercise is not important at all. One of the things that this really overlooks is human physiology. And I hope there are some of you here who do basic science work, because we really need to link the basic science here with the public health message. And so I want to illustrate it this way. So three, here are three cars. And Malcolm, thanks for your picture of your current Volkswagen. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, so th these are three different cars. Now, if my hypothesis is that it's simply the fuel, if I give all of these cars really good fuel, everybody will perform well. It's not likely going to be the case. So what we're doing is we're ignoring the engine. We're ignoring physiology here. The athlete has a different physiology in just about every way from a normal person and from an obese person. And we seem to forget that. Anywhere you look, you look at insulin sensitivity, you look at metabolic flexibility, you look at activity of adipocytes. It's very different in the athlete. And you can't tell me that we should be recommending the same fuel for each of these. So my point is, you have to look at the interaction of exercise, which creates a whole different physiology, and nutrition. And it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And I truly believe, I, believe me, I believe food's important. I absolutely believe food's important. But I think if we're going to be as sedentary as the American public is now, I don't think there's any diet on the planet that will keep us from having high rates of obesity. Again, I am not saying diet isn't important, but in the background of no movement, diet is not powerful enough to keep us lean and healthy. Why can't we accept that we need both? And why can't we study the interaction of the two rather than debating on whether diet or physical activity or physical activity?
this is a cartoon that I, I've um, used for, for several years to think about in moving forward. So let's say this line is the uh, achieving energy balance at the lowest possible fat mass. So that's where you want to be at that line. And so I hear things like, well, you can't outrun a bad diet. Well, in fact, there are people that are probably so physically active they can eat a bad diet and still be lean and healthy. Now, that's not a big part of the population. You look at elite athletes, the, the highest consumers of sugar we've ever seen are elite athletes, and they have virtually no metabolic disease. Now, I'm not advocating consuming sugar. I'm simply saying that we have to put this in perspective. So yes, there are, there are and, and the Amish, if you follow the papers about the Amish, they're very active, very little obesity, and basically they have a meat and potatoes diet. They don't have a sp especially good diet. So you can outrun a bad diet, but I, I, I don't think this is the way for it. I don't think we're going to get everybody to be the Amish or elite athletes. Maybe, the Amish diet, maybe. Uh, on the other end, there are people who really maintain a healthy body weight with very little physical activity. We see some of those in the National Weight Control Registry. This is a registry of people that have maintained successful weight loss over time. I'll tell you, it's about 9% of the people we study. It's low, but there are people that do it. How do they do it? They're vigilant with food intake. They spend a lot of time on food intake. This again is not a small part of the population, and I don't think we should, we should bank on this as a strategy. For most people, it's here. We're going to have to have some interplay of changing diet and changing physical activity. Now my bias, and this is a bias, is the more we can increase physical activity, the more leeway we have with diet. Not saying diet isn't important, but physical activity is a little buffer for the diet. So literally, the more active you are, the more fun you can have with your diet. So here, it gives us two things to vary, diet and physical activity. And this is where we're going to be with most of the population. No strategy that focuses on diet alone or physical activity alone, in my opinion, is really going to be effective for the majority of the population. My friend Morgan Downey is compiling causes of obesity. These are causes for which there's at least one published paper. In fact, this is old. He's now over 100. So 100 causes of obesity that are documented by at least one publication. So what do you do with this? Here's the way we're approaching it right now. We're looking at this. Maybe we're not looking at it, but we're saying, I think these things are important. And I'm going to go out and study these things. I'm going to study this or that, both from a causal point of view or a treatment point of view. So it's trial and error. Now let me ask you, with over 100 potential causes, and you may dismiss some of those, but the point is, there are a lot of causes. How likely is it that we're going to, we're going to end up on that exact combination of factors that's going to reduce obesity? You're going to say, I want to take number 9, number 37, and number 66, and I want to test it might work, but again, you look at this and say, how do we get a handle on doing that? We can't do RCTs on every combination of these factors. Now again, my bias is no single factor, two factors, three factors, four factors are going to make a difference. Whatever we do to reverse this, we're going to have to hit many, many factors. I don't know how many they are, but I think it's going to be it's going to be a group. And then what we risk is looking at one factor and saying, oh, you know what? That didn't play a role. So we throw it out when, in fact, that factor with two or three others might have been part of the solution. So you see the dilemma. As an investigator, what do you do with this? How do you decide? Say you're someone that really wants to look at interventions for obesity. How do you decide which of these to go after? Here are some, I, I just pulled together some tactics commonly advocated to reduce obesity. And those in red are ones for which there have been recent papers suggesting they don't play a role. Sort of saying, well, we thought breastfeeding played a role in obesity. Studies suggest it didn't. And I'm, I'm not saying these are definitive, but here are some common things that are done that when you go out and look at some research, there's at least some research suggesting these don't play a role. 
So, so food deserts is a great one. We, we really thought, you know, it's, it's these inner cities, lack of fruits and vegetables, if we simply put in supermarkets, um, that'll change things. And, and a lot of the data suggests it doesn't. But again, that's, it, it, it's unfair to look at something like this alone. You wouldn't expect that any single factor alone would have an effect. So maybe we're throwing out a factor that's important when combined with other things. So I think we need some new thinking here. Our current approaches are, are linear and proximate. They're typically focused on single factors. We'll get into this a little later on. Are they, are they really based on American values? And I'm going to, toward the end of the talk, get into some, uh, so, some, some psychology and some mental stuff that has nothing to do with diet. They're not based on positive incentives, not seeking an alignment with purpose, and I'll explain that more, and not grounded in evolutionary theory. I love the evolutionary biologists who really look at obesity in an evolutionary perspective. So in some ways our training is holding us back because we're taught to be reductionist. We're, we're taught to find these single factors and figure out how they contribute. I think if we're going to have to solve obesity, at least some of us are going to have to think differently. And at the end, I'll come back to some specific advice for some of the young folks in this room that may be seeking a career to address obesity. It's a little bit like the blind man and the elephant in how you approach this. Is it a behavioral issue? Is it a physiological issue? Is it a motivational issue? On and on and on. So you guys are here. Clearly, obesity is a nutritional issue. But clearly, nutrition alone is not going to solve the problem. So if you're involved in nutrition, I think you have to at least recognize the possible influence of these other areas. We're not going to solve this by coming up with the perfect diet. Coming up with a good diet is a critical factor, but it's not the only factor. So if you're trained in nutritional science, there are a lot of things you can do within nutrition, but if you really want to focus on the bigger issue of obesity, I think you have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit, and we'll talk a little later on on how to do that. It's really easy to think about how to, how to address obesity, right? So here, here's the model. All you gotta do is use this model. Right? Now this is the Forsyth model in, uh, in uh, the UK. It's actually brilliant. If you actually look at it, it makes a lot of sense uh, because it shows different systems. It shows different systems you have to look at to really understand obesity. But look at what's in the center if, you're, uh, if your vision is good enough. Uh, it's energy balance. And this is the framework that I've used my entire career to think about obesity. Everybody says, well, or, or some people say, it can't be as simple as energy balance. What this slide shows you is energy balance isn't simple. Look at all of the influences on energy balance. But energy balance is the way of understanding physiology-wise how the body regulates weight. And I think it's the right framework for going forward. So, I'm going to talk about energy balance as a complex adaptive system. So you typically see it as well, weight is the result of energy in and energy out and energy stored. And that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I truly believe that anything that leads to weight loss is going to do it through negative energy balance. Anything that leads to weight gain is going to do it through positive energy balance. But this is not a simple equation. We are hard pressed to even measure this with enough accuracy to be able to look at weight gain or weight loss. But theoretically, it's exactly right. I do not believe that anything affects weight that doesn't affect it through the system. Microbiome, sleep, all those things are ultimately going to have an effect on the energy balance system. We may not understand it, but I believe in the laws of thermodynamics, and I believe that it provides a good framework for moving forward. So here's another way of sort of looking at the energy balance system. This active regulation is something that I think we don't devote enough effort to. This is physiology. This is metabolism. And the great example I showed you before 
is a athlete and a non-athlete. That athlete is going to function, their brain's going to function differently, their hormones are functioning, muscle, they have metabolic flexibility, gut microbiome. All these things are critical because they affect the engine in all this. And those of you studying basic science and either clinical, there's so much room for really good research in this area to look at the systems that are involved in the act of regulation. There are behavioral factors. Clearly there's diet, there's physical activity. We know more and more sleep is so critical for obesity. Um, stress, mental state, motivation. And then in recent years, more the environment. Family structure, built environment, social environment, media, marketplace. Let me tell you in my background, when I started out a long time ago, I started out in physiology. And I thought obesity was the result of broken physiology. And once I understood that and fixed it, I was going to win the Nobel Prize for curing obesity. And I spent a lot of time studying this. And what I realized is that with rare exceptions, physiology isn't broken in obesity. Physiology is working perfectly fine for the environment we've created. So it's not as if we're trying to fix something. And then I said, well, it must be behavior. And so I moved on to trying to understand behavior. And I realized at the time that behavior is so influenced by the environment in which we live. What we eat isn't a function of our hunger and our brain necessarily. It's where we live and where we shop and what food's on our plate. So I sort of went from one to the other to the other. And I came back and realized that we actually have to understand them all to understand this. Now, the typical way that people would approach this is, well, the environment affects our behavior, and our behavior affects our physiology. And, and that's true to some extent. But I actually think it goes the other way. Our physiology can affect our behavior and our environment. In a way, the fact that we have grocery stores on every other corner is a function of our physiological desire to have food security and always have something to eat. The fact that we have... Uh, Big screen TVs and internet is a function of our desire to not have to work very hard and be entertained. So it goes both ways. And it's a very complex system. So how do we begin to get a handle on this? And if you're sitting out there saying, I'm starting a research career. What do I do with all this? You're making my head swim because it's so complex. I just want to design a research study. How do I design a research study to make a difference? Well, I think our energy balance system is the right system but it operates in a complex system environment. And I think to understand this, we're going to have to look at tools that maybe many of us haven't been familiar with before. What I want to argue is that regulation of body weight is a little bit like a complex adaptive system. Now, a complex adaptive system, if you don't know what that is, is a system that many factors can affect it, and then suddenly one factor can, can, can cause it to change. So it may not be always linear. So for example, if you look at the period, say from 1960 to the early 80s, obesity rates were pretty low. They may have been going up a little bit, but, but actually this is when I first started with obesity research, and nobody cared about obesity back then. It was sort of a rare thing, and yeah, there were a few obese people, but it wouldn't really seem as a problem. So what happened? between this period of time. Well, I bet you, if we just went around the room and said, what changed between 1960 and 1980, you would come up with probably hundreds of things that have changed. How do you know which one led to that increase? And in a complex adaptive system, it's the system keeps assimilating things, stays the same, then you get that one garage door opener, and boom, the whole system changes. And it looks like what's happened is now the system may have re reacquired and stabilized at a new level. This is a possibility. So if you're doing this, it's hard to take any one of these factors and say changing these factors is going to change it back. And one of the questions I have is, are we at a new steady state? And that steady state can probably go up or down. So we may not be done with this epidemic. I think it's too soon to say. So how do you study complex adaptive systems? Well, you have to look at a lot of different things. Food systems, physical activity systems, inactivity. We're now suspecting inactivity may be independent from activity. Even things like political systems, employment, education, 
again, wow, this is, this is overwhelming. What's a researcher going to do with all this? So I think we have to look at new tools. And a lot of those tools are models. And I've become very intrigued by the different kinds of models involved. And there are tons of models out there. Now, the good news is you don't have to go and become a modeler. If you want to do, that's great. But there are a lot of people out there who have developed models that you can use or that you can collaborate with. I don't think we're going to figure out the way forward by trial and error. Remember all those 82 factors. I don't think just going to those and trying to look at the literature and come up with the top three or four is going to do it. I think we've got to have a model to help us understand and prioritize the kinds of research we do. These models can look at, at very complex interactions and give us possible outcomes. So from an energy balance point of view, there are a couple of models out there. You may recognize Kevin Hall has one and Diana Thomas has one. And basically, these models would say, look, if you were to reduce carbohydrate and increase physical activity by this, here's how the system should operate. Okay. So what it can do is to give you some ideas for the kinds of studies you want to do. If you say, gee, I think these two factors are important, you run the model and it makes absolutely more, no difference, doesn't mean the model's right, but it will give you a little bit of a priority for where you should spend your time. And so they can help you pick from a lot of different possibilities about how to move forward. So the other kind of model that I've been intrigued in are agent-based models. Anybody know about agent-based models? Oh, good. So you can believe anything I say, because I'm not sure I totally understand it. But, it, but an agent-based model in this day and era can essentially uh, replicate a community. So it can go, it can take uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and it can go online and get information about SES and employment and everything. And then it really reproduces a community. Person by person, it, it sort of develops these people that are typical of that neighborhood. And then it allows you to say, well, what would happen if we uh, kept the schools open uh, in the evening? And the model would tell you maybe physical activity increases, da, 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 da. I'll give you one quick example. The model was used in, uh, in Indianapolis. They were having low rates of graduation. People weren't graduating from high school and going to college, and all the Education people said, no, more math, no, more science, no, more arts. And, and, and so they ran this model. And the model said the reason was safety. And of course, the education people said, no, nah, it's, like, it's crazy. It's not that. So they did the experiment. They did an experiment to add more math and science. And they did an experiment to look at safety. And sure enough, when they made the schools safer, graduation rates were higher. And as they looked at this, it turns out gangs were a big deal and people didn't feel safe at schools. But the idea is nobody would have picked that as the solution without the model. And again, I'm not saying the models are the be all end all because the models can be wrong. But these are tools that can help us understand the complexity. And so again, models can help us direct the research and then the research can come back and improve the models. So the other thing we need to do is involve more people. So yes, we need nutrition involved, but we need those other specialties involved. And one of the things we don't do well is creating ways for these disciplines to interact. And with this wonderful new building you have, I think it's just a perfect place to bring in people from different disciplines to interact, to debate, and to look at innovations. So here's where I really want to go with the rest of the talk. Obesity is not really the problem. I've learned this over the past few years. Obesity is a symptom of the problem. We do a lot of weight management. We have thousands of people come through. And they all come through thinking that obesity is their problem. And when they come out, what they realized is obesity was a symptom of their problem. Having a BMI of less than 25 doesn't equal wellness. Just being at a normal BMI is not wellness. What people really want is wellness. The problem is they don't know it until you explain. So what I'm going to do is the remainder of the time I have, I want to tell you where we're going with this and what we've been doing at the University of Colorado and why I think it's sort of one of the areas that's been missing both at an individual and population level as we're thinking about how to address the problem. So here's our typical weight management scenario. Tom Wyden calls these V studies. We get the weight off and the weight comes back and 
you know, here's one where they used all kinds of different diets. And we're out there debating on should we do this diet and how much carbohydrate and how fat. And I'm not saying those aren't important, but in the overall scheme of things right now, we get weight regain in most people regardless of the diet we give them. And I'm not saying it's important and you shouldn't be doing that research. That's part of it. But overall, our success in producing weight loss is tremendous. I'll give any of you a money back guarantee on weight loss. The problem is keeping it off. I won't give you a money back guarantee on keeping it off because we can get the weight off. We send you back out into the environment that caused the weight gain in the first place and we expect you to keep it off. So here's the current state, which is not, not very promising. What we've done at our place is we've created a weight, weight management programs that we call transformative weight loss. And I'll, we use this word for a reason, and I'll come back and explain that. Uh, part of this is based on a book uh, that my colleague, Dr. Holly White, and I wrote. If you want to contribute to my retirement, you can buy a copy. Um, it, it, the reason I mention it is not to get you to buy a copy, although you can if you want. But a lot of what I'm talking about is in the book. So if you want to know more about some of this, it is in there. Where we, Holly and I, have been treating obesity for two decades. And we've been totally focusing on the what. Our sense was if we find that exact diet and that exact physical activity program, it'll connect with people, they'll lose weight and they'll keep it off. What we have understood from our research and from a lot, helping a lot of people lose weight is we only got a third of it right. We were focusing on the what, but we weren't focusing on the why or the how. And focusing on the why or the how has totally revolutionized how I think about weight management. Not saying the what isn't important. You gotta have a good what. But without the why and the how, you get those V studies, you get weight regain. So, so what does that mean? And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview. You start with the why, the motivation. Why are people going to change anything? And when I first started this, I thought, well, that's silly. Everybody knows why they wanna lose weight. And, and, and that's not the case. So Holly, who's, uh, one of the best weight management people in the country, she does an exercise she calls peeling the onion. So why do you want to lose weight? Well, you know what, I've got a reunion coming up. I want to, I want to look good. Why? Why do you want to do that? Well, because, and you keep doing the why and the why. And what you're looking for is sort of an internal motivation. And it's there. It's amazing to me. Now, some people can get it right away. And some people takes a while. People get, we, we talk about, getting in touch with your purpose. Why, why are you on this earth? What is it that's important for you? You're saying, well, what's that got to do with weight loss? It's got everything to do with weight loss because that's the motivation for change. What we're asking people to do is really hard. We're asking them to behave in a way that's in direct opposition to their biology. Don't eat the things you really like and get out and move when you really want to sit on the couch. What we found is if you can tie into that deep purpose and motivation, it makes a big difference. It's why people will continue to do this. Oftentimes we start with the what without understanding why, and it doesn't work. The, the what, uh, people will make short-term changes, but without the why, it's not sustainable. We talk about aligning your behavior and your purpose. And in fact, I probably have a slide later on. That's my definition of wellness. The best definition of wellness that I've come up with in, in really four years of studying this, is you're well when your lifestyle is aligned with your value and purpose. And when that's not the case, you're well, really well. Now I'm getting away from nutritional sciences here, but this is my journey. As I started out thinking it was all behavior, but now I understand the importance of the motivation. Now we've applied this very effectively. We spend a lot of our time, our programs are generally delivered in groups. And we spend as much time on the why as we spend on the what. Because again, it keeps people in touch with that motivation. It's the long lasting motivation. It's the North Star that keeps them aligned with their purpose. And people keep coming back to this once they figure it out. Um, I'll give you one quick story. We used it in the book. This guy, we, we were doing the why with him and, and you know, why do you want to lose weight? And he said, I want to fit in a roller coaster seat. 
turns out he had gone with the son to some amusement park. They had stood in an hour long line. They got up there. He was too big for the seat. It wasn't about the roller coaster seat. It was about him being a good father. And once he got in touch with that, it made all the difference in the world in his behavior change. So motivation is aligning your behavior with the inner purpose. Once we went, we went back to the National Weight Control Registry to see if in fact it fit with these people who are keeping weight off. And in fact it did. It fit very well. If you look at these people, they're keeping off an average of 70 pounds for seven years. What they've done is they've aligned their purpose and values. They've gotten jobs that are in the wellness field, so they've tied their behavior to their livelihood. Uh, many of them change spouses because the spouse is not supportive and they get somebody who supports them, they change where they live. So they've done this. So successful people do it. It really fits very, very well. So again, wellness occurs when your lifestyle is aligned with your core values. Aligned with your core value. It's a lot of different things. Th these are the techniques for behavior change. So we've become very involved in behavioral science. Uh, it doesn't matter if we come up with the best lifestyle program in the world if we can't get people to adhere to it over the long time term. So behavioral science is very important. I don't have a lot of time to go into these. Positivity, it's funny, we get people that come in, I want to go on your weight loss program, I know it's not going to work, I'm going to hate it, I hate to exercise, I'm not going to be successful. Guess what? You're not. But you can change that. Resiliency, sleep, gratitude is an important one. Pay it forward. And everybody that comes out of our program has a plan for how they're going to go out and help others. And yes, it helps others. It also helps them. Accountability, willpower, etc. The what are the tactics? This is a lifestyle program and this is important. I don't mean to negate this. Here you have to appreciate physiology. For example, you have to appreciate what physical activity does to metabolism. You have to understand the biology of food intake regulation. You have to understand the importance of sleep and stress. And at the end of the day, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. There are going to be different lifestyle programs for different people. Maybe genetics and other things will help us understand that. I don't have any trouble in thinking that's going to happen. And if you're working in this area, it's an important, important area. But whatever you develop, has to, we have to get people to adhere to it. Now, one of the things that we did a few years ago, I got a call from a guy who said, I'm a producer of a reality television show. I want to come see you. Well, you know, I met with the guy. He said, I want to film our show at your center. So the show is Extreme Weight Loss. Those of you who aren't familiar with it, there were two shows. Biggest Loser was sort of a contest. Extreme Weight Loss is a one-year transformation. No winner, no loser. Everybody goes through a one-year transformation. We were very skeptical of doing this, but it turns out the philosophy of the show is very similar to our philosophy, really the motivation and the why. And it was, we filmed that show two years. It's been discontinued or hasn't been picked up now. But we really learned so much from it. Here are some of the people before and after in the show. Now I know, you're going to say you're on TV. If you're on TV, you can lose weight. I get it. But it, it, it shows you the extent to which people change. And, and look not just at their body, but look at their facial expression. I mean, these people come in, their life's in the toilet. They're the most miserable people I've seen. They're picked for that. This is entertainment. It's television. But when they come out, they really have changed. 47% weight loss in one year. I can't do that, can you? 47%? Again, it's being on television. But I think we can learn a lot from this kind of transformation. And these people talk about a transformation. There are different people after one year. What we wanted to see is, well, not everybody can be on a television show. So how can we take what we learned from the television show and offer it to other people. So we came up with a program that right now is called Destination Boot Camp. People come to our center, and we have a center very much like this one. They come for one week from all around the country. They come in groups, usually two groups, 15 each. And in that week, we work on group bonding and we work on preparing them for weight loss. Then they engage us virtually, basically through a video conferencing technology for the rest of the year. And we've had amazing experience with this. Right now, about a third of the people don't make it through. And the other two-thirds, our average weight loss is 22% at the end of one year. Now, those of you in the weight management field, that's really good. It's not the 47% 
of um, what the TV show gets, but it's way better than the 5% that's being widely promoted. 5% will definitely improve health, but it's a hard sale. It's a hard sell for the patient, hard sell for the provider. We're at 22%. I, will they keep it off? We're continuing to follow them. Our first group is about a year and a half out. But these people come back in as different people. They are transformed. And they realize that weight loss wasn't their problem, but a symptom of their problem. They've used their weight to basically be on the sidelines of life. They use their weight as an excuse not to live life, not to have relationships, not to go out and do things. We talk about a personal identity shift. They become different people. And when you ask them, what's great about your year? Weight loss is always in there, but rarely is it the first thing they talk about. The, the number one thing is, I got my life back. My relationships are better. I have more energy to do things. I know I lost 100 pounds. So they get it, and they all came in looking for weight loss, but what they got was something different than weight loss. So to focus on treating obesity, we have to concentrate on other things than obesity. Just being at a normal weight is not wellness, it's not happiness, it's really up here. This is where the challenge is. And I'm not dismissing the what. Those of you working on the what, we still need that research but we need the why and the how. So here's our model now. We have a group of behavioral scientists together, and our model is that initially in weight loss, you use a lot of executive function. This is the front part of your brain where you make conscious decisions, you decide what to eat and all this other stuff. But over time, you make this shift, this identity shift, so that these behaviors become automatic. You become a different person with different behavioral patterns. And so this is the model we're working on, and we're doing a lot of research now to sort of re-engineer our success. We get amazing success with this program. We don't totally understand what it is we're doing that makes a difference. We know the gestalt works, and now we're going back using this model, trying to understand what works and understand how we can enhance both executive function and self-identity to get better outcomes. So what I've talked about is applying this model to individuals, and that's what we've done very successfully. And I will tell you, we've now, in Destination Boot Camp, done several hundred people. And it works. It's sort of trust the process. If you complete the year, you are transformed. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm such a believer in the process. So how do we apply this to the population? How do we do the what, why, and how in the population? So again, what's the why? As a society, why do we care? Why do we care about obesity? Is it health care? Is it social justice? Is it global competitiveness? Is it Work performance, productivity, national security, all these things have been suggested. But, but, but as a society, what's the thing that gets us going? Where is that motivating factor that says, oh my God, as a society, we've got to address this problem because of X. I don't know what it is, but I think we need some thought. Our, I think our interventions have to be consistent with American values, or at least in this country. Like it or not, we have this sense of freedom that we don't want to be told what to do. We want to make the healthy choices. And it's a sense of fairness. A great example is smoke-free environment. So if you were smoking and it didn't affect me, it's sort of, I don't care. But suddenly, your smoking affects me? Oh my god, that's un-American. We can't have that. And it led to bans in public places and everything. We have to frame, I think, our intervention in ways that go beyond paternalistic notions of saving you from yourself. We have to leverage something positive at a higher level. And again, I think one of the things that we've seen over and over and over, when people lose weight and get well, they talk about more energy. And I think we could do this as the fuel for prosperity. I think it would hit global competitiveness, uh, military security. If you're well and you have that feeling, and looking around, probably a lot of people in this room know what it means to really feel good. A lot of people we deal with don't even know what that feels like. I think taking this on for the population is something that's going to be the fuel for the continued prosperity of our society. And I think we need big, something big and inspirational if that's going to happen. Uh, again, we must count for our heritage. We were, we, our, our metabolism built in a, came, was, was built in a different environment where uh, we didn't have enough food and we had to be physically active. And we have to understand this going forward. Uh, 
Maximize winners and minimize losers. We are building silos in this field at a time where we need to tear those silos down. We can't compete against each other. We need to use things like game theory to figure out how, how, we, how we work together and how we maximize the winners in all this. We need everyone at the table, including the food industry. Uh, we're not going to regulate and litigate our way forward. We have to look at consumer demand. We ask the food companies to make healthy food, but we've got to recognize we've got to create a man demand for that. Um, and finally, I think we're going to need it all. We need economics. We need regulation. We need nudges, rewards, penalties, inspiration, social cost. This problem is so huge, I won't have to use every single thing to do that. And my final slide, those of you starting out your career, to address obesity, you can't just be good at nutrition. You can play a role, but you have to be comfortable with new tools. You need to collaborate with people that have different expertise. You need to get out of your comfort zone. We tell people in our weight loss programs, growth occurs outside of your comfort zone. I think it's the same for you. Get uncomfortable. Find people doing modeling. Find people with expertise in other areas and work together. And I think there's an amazing opportunity for creativity and innovation. I don't think we're on the right track, but I think we can get on the right track. And we need those of you starting out to be innovative and creative. Think outside the box. Think outside your comfort zone. Thanks to all the people I work with. And thank you very much for your attention today. That's a great question. It's one we've taken on. We have done adults, but we now are collaborating with folks at, who study childhood obesity to look at how this would translate. I think in some groups, like teenagers, I think it would work well. It's this idea of what does it mean to be in touch with your purpose and values as a child? So the short answer is, I don't know, but I'm fascinated to work with people that work with kids to think about some of the things that might translate. And we're just beginning to think about uh, designing some of those studies. I, I, it's a great question. My gut feeling is it will work, but I don't have any data to support it. Great question. It's a fascinating lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is regarding your extreme uh, loss program. Do you see any negative physiological changes with such a rapid change? You know, um, let me address that through the TV show, because in the TV show, the men lose sometimes 100 pounds in three months. Okay? I've always said, boy, I don't know, I think slow, gradual weight loss may be the way to go. We carefully monitored them physiology, including metabolism and body composition. And what we, again, keep in mind, a lot of this is heavy activity. What we found on most of the men, they were losing almost 100% body fat through this program. We did not see any negative effects on, uh, we, we, we monitored the heart very carefully, body composition. One thing, they all got orthopedic injuries of some sort because they were working so hard, but they played through it. We went to our orthopedic folks and they just got involved in the best way and sort of saying, we will help keeping you move. These people that are losing weight, they get these injuries, they don't want to stop working out. But that was the only negative we saw is almost everybody would have some. And, and these are 400 peop, pound people that are really hitting it vigorously on exercise. Okay. I have two quick questions real yeah. quick. Um, you brought up modeling a couple times. Yeah. And I read your paper <laughs> that surmised that you would increase the stability of being able to sustain weight loss if you were to do it with your friend's yeah. friend yeah. as yeah. opposed to your friend. Um, how, how might that be actually utilized is my one question. And the other is I'm curious who you work with in physical activity when breaking down silos 
when, at least my finding, are most people who are physical activity are focusing on performance rather than community outreach? Wow, two great questions. So first of all, the paper you're referring to, we worked with the modeler and did exactly that. And it came out, what, what the paper said is, they, they did modeling of social networks, essentially. And the conclusion was that you're going to be more likely to be more successful if you hang out, not with your friends, but your friends of friends. And, and I'll have to tell you that I totally don't understand that one. That's one where the model came out, and uh, we haven't been able to use that one. What we do is, if you look at our destination boot camp, these are people from all over the country, and they've bonded as a group. They get together for weekends. They've become, you know, such a such a support group. So I, I have to tell you, I don't have an answer for that one. That's what the model said, but we hadn't been able to figure it out. And the second one is, yeah, there are a lot of people in physical activity that are interested in performance, but there are a lot of people that are interested in weight management and this stuff. They're out there. And again, I'll try to go to the American College of Sports Medicine meeting, and they always have a lot of good symposium on weight management and metabolism and everything. We need to help people understand the powerful effects on fitness, on metabolism. It just it gives you a better engine to work with if you're fit than if you're unfit. So they're out there, and I've worked my whole career with people in that area. So there are out there. And, and again, I think here through this building and everything, you've got the, the ability to bring those people together. And you may have a language problem initially. You may use different terms. But uh, I just think it's such a natural for nutrition and exercise science to work together. Uh, thank you very much for Interesting talk. Um, I teach the introduction to agriculture and food systems, and we definitely take a systems approach. So my ears picked up when you talked about it being a symptom of bigger things. Uh, certainly when I talk to our farmers and others, that they see our dysfunction around eating and things like obesity as a poverty issue. And I didn't see poverty and the lack of choices as part of this, and I'm wondering if you can unpackage it a bit, because it seems that the people you're working with have means and ability yeah. to access your programs, and there's a certain privilege to it. So could you address the poverty piece? In Absolutely. Business? Thank you very much for the question. And what we know is that obesity is a, is a greater problem in people of poverty and low SES. What I would say is it's, it's also a problem everywhere. And I think eventually the reason that we start with who we are is these are people that are actually able, not just the, the finances, but the time to do that. A lot of times in some of our poor communities, let's face it, obesity is a problem, but it's not necessarily priority. So what our programs are based on are people sort of motivated to change. So it, it's a great point, and I'm glad you brought it up. I'm not saying that our programs will transfer there. What we set out to do is to see if in any population we could create weight loss. My own opinion is our programs are going to be, have to be different in, in, um, in, in those populations because those people aren't prioritizing it the way people who come to us are. Doesn't mean it's not important, it's critically important, but I think we're gonna to have to come up with innovative ways to help them change, whereas they may have five or six things that are most critical to their life than losing weight. So, you know, what we decided, and maybe it's a cop-out, is we, we're gonna start where people were interested to see if we can make a difference. I think eventually we wanna get there. I just think those populations are hard. They're incredibly needy, but they're very difficult given that it, it's hard enough if somebody's motivated to change. If it's not that high, it's even more difficult. So I think we're going to have to rely more on environmental um, interventions in those populations than what we're relying on, which are the behavioral and motivational issues. But great point. I'm glad you brought it up. We have one more here and then a couple of questions. So my question was, you talked about the success that you had with this program, but what about um, people that didn't respond, did you have any of those situations? And what were the reasons why they would not respond? So we, it looks like in the first few hundred people, um, uh, about uh, a third, it's getting a little less, uh, don't complete the year. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is financial. So 
they, they pay at different stages. So one is financial. And another is that I think there are a lot of people who start a weight loss program and, and aren't truly committed to the work it takes. Our program takes a lot of work. They have homework, they have to post on social media. It, it, it's not easy to do. And I think one of the things that we would love to do in the future is identify a little bit who's able to do this. And, and, and let me emphasize, this is not an easy thing to do. This is difficult. And the people that we touch are highly, highly motivated to do it. We may not get those same results in a general population. It's the people that are really motivated and ready to do the hard work. So we realize that we're doing it maybe in a, in a very narrowly defined population, but, but we need to start somewhere. And I think as we learn more there, we'll figure out how to get to the other folks. But it's a great question. And no, we don't know a lot about those people, and I would love to study them a little more. Yes. Uh, first of all, we certainly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I would just like to say, in my humble experience, stress is when I try to move on the best of the least to me. And it's an escape. Eating is an escape, as is alcohol, smoking, and drugs. And as we move through our society, each year the level of sophistication becomes higher, and that raises the stress level. And I think there's where your problem is, at least the primary problem with your back. Unless you can pick at the individual and reduce their stress level, you're not going to get them to lose weight. So I agree with you about 90%. I agree that stress is a huge issue, and it's an underappreciated issue, right? We don't recognize how important stress is. I don't think it's reducing stress as much as helping people deal better with stress. So we do something called resiliency training. The idea is you're going to have stress, and, and in a way, stress is a growth period. But what you have to do is address stress and have downtime. And what we are now is this constant stress. We go from one to the other. So what we found is most successful to help is resiliency training. So we people how to deal with stress and then get downtime from stress before you get the next one. Dr. Fisher. Uh, we'll have one more question and we're going to leave it to uh, Dr. Fisher. I wanted to ask your program essentially describes a treatment program for obesity. But what about prevention? Can mm -hmm. any parts of this be utilized for prevention? Absolutely. So what I think is treating obesity is going to be the same behaviors, but even more intense to treat. I think we can apply those same behaviors to prevention. So if you look at the why and the how, we're not spending a lot of time in prevention doing that. We're trying to tell people what to eat and exercise, and those are important. But I think as a population, applying the why and how to prevention is exactly the right way to go. Now, I, like everybody else in this room, probably inherently believe that we're more likely uh, going to be successful at prevention than treatment. But we don't have a lot of evidence to suggest that. We don't have a lot of success either on treatment or prevention. But I do believe that the same strategies that work for treatment will be effective when applied to prevention. So we've come to the end of the presentation. Before we go, I want to um, uh, uh, give this plaque uh, in recognition for the Hans Fischer Lectureship, April 13, 2016, to James O'Hill, PhD, uh, for the talk, What Will It Take to Reduce Obesity in the Population? Thank you.